so I was gonna start off uh, with some brief introductions. I'll introduce myself quickly. I'm Rick Beckman. I'm the chief medical officer of Reneuron. I'm an ophthalmologist by training. I've been in full-time industry for the last 18 years. This is my second regenerative medicine company. I used to be the chief medical officer of a company called Neurotech, where we were doing encapsulated cellular delivery. We transfected retinal pigment epithelial cells to produce uh, ciliar neurotrophic factor for retinitis pigmentosa, and also uh, to produce something that was very similar to ILEA for wet AMD. I've now been at Reneuron for the last uh, three years where we have stem cell based therapy. Currently we're in the clinic with human retinal progenitor cells, which we're injecting subretinally for retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, we had to pause and discontinue a large uh, stroke program that we were doing with our neural progenitor cells uh, on account of COVID. We were injecting uh, cells into people's brains for ischemic stroke disability. Uh, that's currently on hold right now. Um, that being said, what I'd like to do is turn to the rest of the, uh, the panel and uh, we'll start with Stefan. You want to introduce yourself to your company a little bit? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Well, there is some strong ego. Uh, so, Stefan Boissel, I'm the CEO of uh, Sparing Vision. I joined uh, Spain Vision as CEO um, at the end of the summer last year, and I was uh, for the last two years prior to joining Spain Vision uh, in San Francisco, head of corporate strategy at Sangamo. And I've been in this industry for uh, 20 years in different uh, or various C level on board uh, capacity. Uh, Spain Vision is a genomic medicine company in ophthalmology, obviously. Um, and our lead asset, uh, SPVN06, is a mutation agnostic gene therapy, which aim at uh, not uh, uh, restoring vision by uh, replacing or defaulting or missing gene, but uh, at uh, slowing or stopping the progression of RP by introducing uh, in the retina uh, a combination of a neurotrophic factor on, a, on an enzyme. Pleasure to be here today with you. Excellent. Thank you. I'll, I'll go to Jane now. Yeah, this is Jane Lubkowski. Uh, I'm the president of a company called Regenerative Patch Technologies based in California. And we're developing a little bioengineered implant which contains retinal pigmented epithelial cells that are derived from pluripotent stem cells on a perylene membrane scaffold that is used as a tissue engineering or tissue engineered approach for the replacement of defective tissues in patients with uh, geographic atrophy. I've been involved in both cell and gene therapies for the last 30 years, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much, Jane. I'll go on now to Bernard. Yeah, thank you, uh, Rick. Uh, so my name is Bernard Gilly. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Gene Sites Biologics, a gene therapy company um, operating in the eye with uh, the first product called Lumevoc, expecting approval um, by the end of this year in Europe and likely by the end of 2022 in, in the US. We are also have a second program leveraging optogenetic technology. And I've been in the industry for the last 30 years. And this is my second gene therapy company. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Federico. Hi, uh, I'm Federico Mingotti. I'm the CSO uh, at uh, Spark Therapeutics. And I've been with the company for, uh, for about four years. Before I was in uh, France at the Inserm and Genethon. And before that at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I've been in gene therapy for uh, uh, 20 plus years. And I had the privilege of being involved in a lot of the studies that led to the approval of uh, Luxterna uh, when I was at, at CHOP. And um, I've always worked on the on in vivo gene transfer uh, particularly AV vectors, uh, many applications, uh, not only ophthalmology, but liver and so on, and the immunology of gene transfer. Excellent, thank you. Um, so what I'm gonna do is turn it right back to you, Federico, because the first question I wanted to talk to, since we do wanna talk about ophthalmic diseases, is what makes the eye, in your opinion, an ideal organ for uh, being able to go into cell and gene therapy? Uh, that's actually, uh, an excellent question, and it's true that the eye was one of the first uh, uh, body sites where gene therapy really showed um, great benefit uh, in across uh, animal models in humans. I think 
part of the story is related to the fact that um, the, the eye is uh, uh, um, an immunoprivileged body site, so uh, immune responses in the eye tend to be less of a problem. Um, and, and as you know, immune responses to viral vectors have been a problem uh, for the field of uh, gene therapy. It's also true that um, the setting is also very local and requires small vector doses. So from an immunological standpoint, that's, um, that's, that's an advantage. And from a CMC, so um, the, the amount of vector that you would need to do gene therapy in the eye is also another advantage because it's very limited. So a number of factors that uh, really uh, contributed to the success of gene therapy in the eye, along with the fact that, um, I mean, the experience with RP65 deficiency, in that case, we had uh, good animal models, uh, both small and large for the disease, and, um, and also the retina itself, which was the target transduction uh, with the AV vectors was well uh, preserved. Um, uh, and, and so that's another point that is very important if you're thinking about in vivo gene transfer, for example. Thank you. You know, Jane, you probably look at this a little differently since you're involved in cell therapy, but you have a background in gene therapy in multiple parts of the body as well. What are your thoughts about going into the eye? You know, I, I agree a lot with what Frederico said. You know, I mean, we've got a small target organ. You know, if you're looking at whether it's cells, you're looking at vectors. You know, the doses that you have to give are relatively small compared to other parts of the body. I think there are good delivery systems in many cases to get access to your target site within the eye for, you know, placing your cells. There's very nice imaging systems that you can use to look at the, you know, the structure, for instance, of the retina and looking at uh, the, uh, you know, structure of various uh, pieces of the eye. And I think, you know, again, there is the potential for it being a relatively immune privileged site. So I think all of those things make it a good target organ for looking at both cell and gene therapies. Uh, thank you. That's interesting. So, you know, one of the other things that we start to think about it and, and, you know, if anybody else has any specific comments, please feel free to chime in. Um, I, I don't want to beat the question to death, but it's still an interesting, it's an interesting question. You know, now that we've established gene therapy in the eye, um, what other things are on the horizon? What do you, what do you get, what do you think about when you think about the next steps that we're going to do? Because we do have gene therapy. Uh, we're, some of us are showing some success now with cell therapy, although it's challenging as we all know. Uh, where do you think we're going from here? Um, Bernard? Well, um, I think, yeah, Luxtona has been, has been a, a, a real success and, and I'm, I'm really happy about this. However, this is an egal one. Huh? So uh, let's, uh, let's keep a little bit, uh, 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 prudence here. Yeah, we uh, Lumevoc is um, the GenSide product is the second one is likely to be the second one. We still have some uh, uh, some some work to continue to do with the European Agency, but it seems to be uh, to be to be well on on track. Um, then I think that we, we know that there is there are a number of of all these programs. I mean, Stefan's one uh, for retinitis pigmentosa. You have also a number of product, uh, the GTC's product, all sorts of things that are more or less mutation agnostic or, or, or mutation directed to mutation, specific, specific mutations. And I think then, um, I think from the eye, I think we should, we should start thinking about getting into the other sensorial sphere uh, and uh, why not in the ear? So one of the things that I like to think about, and I'll ask you guys to comment, and I'm throwing this one out from my experience, is people talk in terms of, you know, you fix a genetic defect, so that allows you to rescue cells that are not necessarily dead yet, but they're degenerating. Um, and with cell therapy, hopefully we're able to potentially replace cells. Does anybody see a role of combination in the future? Have you given any thought to a combination of gene therapy followed by cell therapy and being able to not only rescue cells, but to uh, potentially have differentiation of new cells. Oh, I think that that's I like absolutely. I, like I think that's absolutely part of the the future. 
you know? I mean, you could even envision certain aspects where cells could deliver various other reprogramming factors to allow for that are genetically engineered um, cells that could deliver reprogramming factors to reconstruct the rest of the, the um, portions of the eye, for instance, in the retina. So I do think that uh, various combination therapies and other combinations that might be looked at uh, allowing for better engraftment for uh, less immune rejection. I think that those are very much in the future. And Rick, if I may uh, sure, chime in, so beyond uh, cell and gene therapies, I think uh, we are just at the beginning of uh, seeing other uh, uh, technologies in the field of genomic medicine being applied to the eyes. I'm thinking about you know, genome editing. There are only a, a few handful of players looking at it today, but uh, beyond genome editing itself, you have uh, gene regulation, for example, which start to be explored uh, in CNS, where you can modulate up or down the expression of a gene. And I'm sure we will find uh, ways to use this kind of technology in the eye. And uh, probably in the longer term in the future, we can also start uh, thinking about in vivo reprogramming of cells. Uh, you know, we know how to uh, reprogram cells through um, iPSC, for example, to turn one cell into something else. Uh, why not in the future, uh, for example, turning some, some cells of the retina into new codes? Uh, I know it's uh, science fiction, but uh, at Spang Vision, we are already starting to um, seriously looking at that. But I think one, one thing that I wanted to just add to the conversation, uh, which I, it may sound a little less futuristic uh, when compared to transdifferentiation, which is true that uh, something that uh, we hope to be doing in the future is also, I think we had the first iteration of uh, gene therapies in the eye, but now as we think about uh, genetic disease, non-genetic disease, and some of them are in the clinic, right? And so we wanna uh, target better the eye in larger uh, patient populations. Then the question is, how can we evolve the platform to be able to do that? And so you see a lot of work into the route administration, the delivery. Some, we have some trials on intravitreal administration of vectors or uh, um, <clears throat> supracoroidal, and, and so simplifying the administration and also development of novel gene delivery, uh, novel AD vectors, for example, to transduce the uh, eye when delivered, uh, for instance, uh, via um, uh, the intra vitra, right? With a route administration that is less invasive. So, so since, yeah. you brought that, since you brought that up, I wanted to talk a little bit about routes of administration and what your experience has been with that. I mean, so, so we have a variety of different pathways that we go in the eye. Um, I know that supracroidal is being looked at. I, I used to be the uh, CMO for a while at ClearSide, so I was involved in some of that technology development. So in terms of route of administration, uh, subretinal, a lot of people think that that's a very challenging technique to do because it's fraught with complications. Um, uh, Stefan, uh, tell me a little bit about some of your thoughts on different methods of administration, and then I open that up to everybody else to talk about it as well. Well, I'm not sure I'm the best person to speak to that since our lead product is uh, subretinal, like, like, like you've seen us, so we are not inventing anything here. Uh, but, but definitely uh, both for the lead product in terms of life cycle management, but also for the rest of the portfolio, we start to think about uh, the next uh, generation of uh, either CAPSID or, or Nouvelle Routes of Administration. Being in this space and not uh, being uh, uh, putting this very high in your corporate agenda, I think is the real risk of uh, you know, being at one point out of business because you won't have the right, uh, you know, tool or the right, uh, the right route, excuse me, to deliver your product. Is uh, have you looked at the gyroscope technology? I know that uh, I know uh, Opregen is using that for delivering uh, their molecules subretinally. Have you looked at that at all? I'm not going to comment specifically on one route uh, or one technology, but uh, again, we are looking at. Uh, everything under the sun. Uh, we are not developing this technology. We are going to use this technology through licensing agreements. So I cannot speak to one okay. uh, you know, technology in particular. Anybody else want to comment about that? I've had some experience looking at it myself and I think it's an, a very interesting way of 
uh, potentially doing an ab external approach, being an ophthalmic surgeon and not having to do a vitrectomy. I just wanted to see if there's anybody had any other thoughts on that. I wasn't trying to get into anything that was going to no, have you compromise your intellectual property at all. Bernard, any thoughts? Uh, I think Rick, the, the Frederico's point, yeah, Frederico's point was well taken. I think we, we still have a, a lot to, uh, to do in, in this field. Uh, for Ginsai, we're using intravitreal administration. We, we have a, a very nice transfection yield in, in the retinal ganglion cells. Uh, there, there are a number of, of new vectors or modified vectors that have, are being developed that more or less goes more profound into the, uh, into the retina. Uh, that still remains to be proven, of course, but, but there, there is this possibility. Clearly, uh, I mean, having a vector that go from the surface uh, that could be delivered with, uh, with uh, droplets, I, I don't believe this will, will fly. Uh, um, uh, ever, but uh, intravitreal injection is much more simple. Uh, it's it's fairly it's fairly patient friendly, lasts a few uh, a few seconds. But then you need to go to the right level of uh, uh, the right layer of, of the retina. So if you want to target the photoreceptor or the bipolar cells, that is an issue, and uh, you need to resolve it either by a newer a newer delivery system or by uh, engineering the capsid of the of the EAVs that you are using, and it's not easy. Is, it, uh, is, that, is there a role for directed evolution in this process? And have you had any experience with that, Federico? Um, the, I, I would say there's many ways how we can develop AV vectors and directed evolution versus other technologies. I would say, in my opinion, they, they all seem to be very good. Uh, as, and, and, and equally very bad, right? Because it's a, it's a very difficult search, that's the point. And you have to use the right model, models to test how good is your vector or, or how good you can evolve AV to, to reach a target um, cell, cells in, 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 the, in, the, in the eye. And, and so it has to be tailored to the application, use the right animal model, and then the final jury is always the human trial. So. Uh, it's a long, tedious work. I think it's worth doing. Um, I, I really think it, it is uh, because I'm sure if we evolve the platform a little bit more, we'll have great chances to deliver better drugs to patients. And this is really what we want to do. You know, I think one sort of to add on to it, a little different aspect of, of the delivery is not only physical delivery to the appropriate compartment, okay, but also getting your vector, your cells, whatever you're delivering to actually survive in that particular environment and to bind to your particular targeted cell type to uh, infect or to deliver the payload to your targeted cell type or have your cells survive in that. And I think that that's an area for improvement of efficiency of, of looking at all of these vectors or cells to get them to seed, survive, especially in a diseased environment. So that's a very important aspect, I think, that, that needs to be further evaluated if you're looking at just uh, the delivery of your particular cell type or vector type. And Eric, speaking specifically uh, about uh, directed evolution, we should know very soon uh, for DMT, as you know, uh, I've been, uh, you know, using the vector in a clinical trial that started last year um, in uh, Inkslink uh, RP in collaboration with Roche, and uh, I'm looking forward to see, um, you know, how all that we will translate into um, uh, nice transduction data in the in the very near future. So we should know very soon whether this technology, which which is not new by the way, it has been. Uh, Develop over the last uh, 20 or 25 years uh, is uh, is indeed you know promising for the space. So a couple of things that I wanted to slip in, and it's it's not necessarily flowing with the conversation, but I have you here, Bernard, and and you've had a you've had some very interesting clinical trial results, and and it looks like you have a pathway towards success, and and I give you tremendous kudos for having been able to hang in there for that. Um, how was it? 
ultimately that you were able to overcome the issue of bilaterality of your uh, clinical trial results and you're moving towards success? Well, well in, in fact, I think we, we could have been smarter in, uh, in designing our clinical trials because this is a this is an observation that has been reported in, uh, in rodents by a number of neurobiologists by administrating AV into the, um, into the uh, and anterograde transportation so of genetic material. So either from the periphery to the central nervous system or from central nervous system parts to the periphery. However, we did not. So when we, uh, when we had this observation in human, we, uh, we went back to uh, non-human primates and we did exactly the same experimentation, the same dose, we inject one eye and then we just look at what's ha happening. And we saw, and we demonstrated this, that uh, indeed when you inject one eye, you find the genetic material into the other optic tract. It goes in fact all the way to the chiasma and from the chiasma all the way to the other retina. We demonstrate this is not mediated by anything else but by the neurons. We don't exactly know what is the proportion of uh, a transsynaptic uh, uh, exchanges or the role of the astrocytes because we also know that astro astrocytes are playing a, a fairly important role, particularly when the uh, neuronal systems are stressed. I mean, we it is well known in, uh, in stroke, but uh, there, there are a number of work being done in the glaucoma where uh, when one of the system is stressed, there is a there is a, 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 a astrocytes that are playing a role to bring as much as material as they can to the stressed neurons. So so yes, we demonstrate this in in, in monkeys in, and and we demonstrate this three and six months after the injection. So which really calls for the very same uh, uh, happening in humans. But we also are doing a a. a I'm uh, together the, with the real size at, in Philadelphia, where uh, now um, the um, a a traveling of the mitochondrion through the optic nerves in vivo. And we are going to do this in, uh, in patients after injection of Lumeroc and see the difference between the, the traveling or, or the absence of traveling of mitochondria for the injection and action in the. But what we, what we demonstrated is that. Um, there is a there is a, a transportation by the neurons. It is either from uh, from transsynaptic exchanges, or it might be mediated by the astrocytes. And, and, and that I think, uh, that I think you said you were doing a study. At, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I think you said that you were doing a study at Wills where you were looking at mitochondrial yeah. uh, crossing. Yeah, there's a there's a new. Uh, 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 NMR system that allows to follow the mitochondrion activities uh, in vivo in humans. So uh, Will Size is going to monitor this in patients before administration of Lumevoc and after administration of Lumevoc to see that indeed there is a, a new trafficking of mitochondrion in the two optic tracts after the injections. It's very interesting. Um, you know, th this is a really big example of overcoming uh, quite a bit of a hurdle in order to keep on going. And we've kind of all been there to some extent before. Jane, are there any particular uh, challenges that you've noted in, in cell therapy that would put it a little bit different than gene therapy that you could talk about? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are, are several challenges to uh, different cell therapies and, and the particular approach that you're looking at. So, for instance, you know, one of the things we're looking at, which is putting in retinal pigmented epithelial cells that can be used to support the rest of the retina in patients with geographic atrophy. You know, one of those challenges is looking at the right platform to deliver those cells and also to get them to survive in a fairly angry environment. There's another sort of layer of different challenges that um, for other people who are looking at replacing photoreceptors. 
which is looking at, you know, hey, how do you physically get the photoreceptors into the area of the retina? How do you get them to survive? And then how do you get them to actually create the appropriate circuitry? So I think depending on the particular approach you're looking, there can be relatively small numbers of challenges, I guess comparatively looking at getting these cells to survive and polarize and, and do their normal functions in the retina. But secondly, looking that at the next layer of complexity, which is to recreate the right circuitry. So I think that those are, you know, a couple of the, uh, shall we say, a range of challenges that face cell therapies in the eye. So uh, one of the things that I've noticed, and uh, we're dealing with fetally derived cells, is that depending upon the regulatory area and the, and the environment that you're going into, some places won't let you do it. And I, I, I didn't think that I would run into that, but the, the entire state of Ohio is void of being able to do that. Uh, we've had some difficulty in China. Has anybody, have you experienced anything with your ears or embryonal? Uh, derived uh, stem cells. Uh, have you run into that issue at all? Yeah, we have. I mean, we, we have run into, I think, it. I, again, there's a couple of layers of uh, complexity, which is first a looking at your source material. Is it, um, you know, fetal derived? Is it, in fact, embryonic derived? Just sort of more ethical issues. And there are still some countries and, and jurisdictions where um, that can be a problem. For instance, um, in Ireland, that can be a problem and in various other um, countries that can be a problem. I think the other thing then that sort of layers upon it is what do you know about the cells? Even if they're you know, of a uh, cell type that is, um, you know, doesn't have any uh, concerns in terms of the ethics of it or the, religious aspects of it, that there are still, you know, what do you have to do to satisfy the regulatory authorities about what you know about the cells and the people who de uh, derive those cells and the people who donated those cells. So I think, yes, there, there can be challenges along those lines, and especially in certain jurisdictions. So speaking a little bit about the regulatory challenges, does anybody else want to comment on any specific regulatory challenges? I know that a lot of the, a lot of the template was set forward by the development program for Luxterna. So we now walk down a, a regulatory pathway where there's already standards that have been set. And for me, the interesting thing is the standards that were set were with gene therapy. In other words, you need to treat uh, both eyes uh, you need to do that. And, and, and a lot of that came out of that. Federico, maybe you could comment a little bit about some of the regulatory challenges that, that, you, that you've noticed and then for the others as well. I mean, I, I was thinking that probably I can offer some broad, uh, I mean, what I've seen happening also in the field, right? I, I think a lot of the uh, regulatory challenges are still around CMC potency assay, and and that's where we see a lot of time uh, uh, different programs get into trouble. I think is also those are areas where uh, at the time of you know to to get ready to fall to fall the BA for BLA sorry for uh, Lustana that's where we really work hard on the CMC part because that. I would say the technologies we're using to produce gene therapy vectors sometimes are, are still in development and uh, developing a potency assay is not easy, particularly for, for certain diseases affecting the eye and so, um, but not only. And so that's, those are, those are important regulatory risk. And then of course, we are talking about um, uh, I would say there's probably variability from disease to disease. And so um, for uh, endpoints um, are another area that uh, can easily create some, some issue in the development of a gene therapy for in, in this high space. I, 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 I agree with that entirely. Stefan, do you have any thoughts about some of the endpoints? You've probably been involved in discussions and planning your clinical trials. Any thoughts about some of the challenges associated with that? 
Uh, yeah, well, definitely. And uh, um, uh, this is um, certainly very true for um, a neuroprotective approach, which is not, again, aiming at restoring vision, but preserving what is left of the vision. And uh, it will be extremely challenging for us to focus on a, on a specific you know, endpoint. So we, we hope and, 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 and we believe that the uh, regulators uh, will consider the uh, data as, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a big uh, uh, picture uh, and not uh, focus on a, on a, on a specific, uh, you know, endpoint. And we look at, of course, functional endpoint, structural endpoint, uh, mobility testing, and so on and so forth. But uh, in, in RP in particular, we have our kind of approach where you have a slow, uh, slowly progressing pro progressive disease, excuse me, it will be, uh, again, uh, um, uh, a real challenge if, if ever we have uh, for what will become the registrational study to focus on one single efficacy on point. So we have to think as a whole, and, and we hope that the regulators will be looking also at the data uh, as a whole. Actually, yeah. as, you, as you say that, I would say the other point that is probably important is, is the stratification of the patients, right? Uh, because the the outcome will be highly dependent on on factors such as the progression of the disease at the time of treatment. Well, it's it's interesting because I've been involved in a lot of these conversations. Is for Luxterna, you know, you went after RP sixty five. That's a disease where you have lots and lots of dysfunctional rods, but they're not yet dead, and so you've been able to rescue them and bring them back, and that's why. They respond well to maze testing and FST, not as much to visual acuity per se. Um, you know, the, 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 that's a challenge. Jane, I see you nodding. So what, are, what have been your thoughts on, on picking the appropriate patient populations that you think are gonna be able to see a functional response? Oh, I think it's a challenge right now, you know? Um, I wish I had the, the answer for that. Um, uh, I, you know, don't, it's, it is a huge challenge. and. You know, I um, one of the things that you mentioned about regulatory endpoints, whether it be for a cell or gene therapy, I think we have to get creative on these and trying to look at what is the actual improvement in functional vision that we see with um, these particular therapies and tailor them appropriately. Um, and the challenges yet of creating new endpoints, acceptable endpoints is, is, again, I think it's a huge challenge. I wish I had answers for it. That's, that's an interesting thing. You know, everybody here is, 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 uh, has, has a different mechanism of action that's been involved in, in what they're going after. And, and uh, I wanted to ask Bernard just a little bit, you know, one of the things that you're actually going after is, is, uh, is, is making changes in retinal ganglion cells to make them act more like photoreceptors. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, how has that been? That's, but that's a very out in the, the skinny branches type of approach, but it seems to be that other people are starting to look at it as well. You have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, this is a, our second product, uh, GS30. So we, we, have, uh, we have entered into a clinical phase one, two. I will not disclose the result because we have a we, we have a, a nature medicine paper that is going to, to be released probably in April, uh, but it works. I mean, clearly uh, you restore functional vision in patients who are blind. So we are, this, uh, these patients are recruited for being completely blind from retinitis pigmentosa. And most of them have been, have been blind for uh, a long period of time, several years. And, and you can, you can clearly uh, quite easily see the functional vision because if you if you turn the system on, they can see. If you turn the system off, they, they don't see. So there's a gene therapy component. Okay, we bring the optogenetic protein into the retinal ganglion cells, and then there is a medical device that, uh, in fact, transform the outside visual information into uh, the, the very same information, pixel by pixel, but mediated by by red light, by by a light which. Uh, uh, triggers the the protein to uh, create an action potential, and, and that works really. Uh, you will see. You will see. It, let's, let's wait a couple of weeks to uh, to to the paper. But back to a regulatory issue uh, again. I think Federico's point is right. We are uh, we have much more uh, uh, regulatory issue. I'd, I've had much more regulatory issues with the CMC part, uh, with the potential CSAs. 
rather than the uh, clinical endpoint. Clinical endpoints are what they are. You know, I mean, you have to determine them as a function of the disease you're uh, working with. As you said, Rick, uh, RP65, you cannot really measure this in the, the improvement in visual acuity. I mean, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So, so then there are other uh, uh, metrics. And the good news is that the regulatory agencies, both in the US and in Europe, are looking at those metrics equally. You, you need to validate them, that's for sure. But, but they, are, they are more open than they, it used to be before Luxturna. They are more open to, to these measurements. They're also now listening to patients. Quality of life is very important. And the, report, the patients report about their quality of life are, are, are of, of utmost importance. And then uh, um, uh, Stefan was right, but it, it needs to, uh, to gather a, a number of information that all go uh, in the same directions. And I think that's what uh, will satisfy the regulatory authorities. There's one point though, which is difficult in the eye is as, as you all know, there is no clear relation between structure and function. The only two things you know is that if you don't have any, any more cells, you're blind. If everything's worked correctly, you've got all your cells, you have a good vision. In between, you don't know. You can, you can still see well with probably 75 or, or 80% of the uh, ganglion cells that in, disappear. That's, that's known in glaucoma. It's, it's really late that uh, the, uh, the vision acuity uh, deteriorate. Uh, uh, after the structure has been deteriorating for years. So, so that create another, another uh, uh, issue with the regulatory bodies. So yeah, th that's very interesting. I wanna, I wanna take that up a little bit more. I was actually uh, at Wainwright, uh, Scott Gottlieb uh, did a panel uh, similar to this one on cell and gene therapy. And he made an interesting point. He said, you know, in his first years in, in, as the FDA commissioner, 80% uh, of the effort went into the clinical review of a compound and only 20% went into the product development, meaning the CMC and the non-clinical portions of it. Uh, now it's changed for us. It's about 20% of the review goes into the clinical because it either works or it doesn't and 80% goes into the manufacturing. Um, we're crossing that threshold now where we're looking at developing potency assays and we always said to ourselves, gee, we need to develop a potency assay by the time we're in phase three. But now the regulatory agencies are starting to ask for those even earlier. What has been your experience to that? Jane, you're smiling. So I see, I see you probably had to cross that bridge. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, looking at trying to establish the potency assay and the earlier you can do it, the better. I mean, um, yes, you, it's... You know, it's a challenge and we're looking at um, phase three clinical trials in terms of, you know, having to have a potency assay in time for phase three. But, you know, I encourage people to start looking even earlier because uh, it's a critical component. It's a critical component of what the regulatory agencies are going to be requiring of you. And it's a critical component to understand how to, you know, develop and measure the success of your particular product and your success in your manufacturing protocols. So Stefan, you've been putting together a company. How are you approaching that from the very beginning? Is it, is it, is it scaling up your CMC capabilities to be able to uh, overcome some of these hurdles along the way? Um, yeah, that's a very good point. We, we, we have been really planning for success. So we are anticipating a lot of CMC costs. So for example, we are only going to start our first in-man trial by the end of the year, but we are already working on the commercial manufacturing process. And we will uh, very likely uh, be manufacturing commercial batches as soon as next year, while we will, we will still be in the first in-man study. And when it comes to the potency, we have a stepwise approach. We have a first potency with a certain technology that is developed for the first GMP batch. And then we are in parallel to that, uh, developing what will be the commercial, so to speak, potency assay. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, I don't know, I mean, whether this is uh, the way everybody is doing it, but that's fair vision. Again, we are over investing uh, in CMC just to, uh, to plan for success so that there will be no delay uh, in between the first in man on what uh, uh, hopefully will be the, the registration of study. Anybody else have any thoughts on that before we move on to a totally different area? I mean, okay. I, yeah, the, 
early early work is always a good idea. Yeah, it's it's it's. You just have to convince your investors. But um, uh, uh, nowadays uh, they are a little more relaxed and, and they seem to be uh, more willing to invest upfront in CMC much more so than in the past. So it's a good momentum. It's not like a small molecule where you make a you know a batch a batch of small molecule and try it out in your phase one study and then you do you scale up once you're successful. You need to have a lot more controls in place on this, so it's a lot more challenging. Um, what I wanted to go into a little bit is is uh, some of the uh, the economic and reimbursement type of uh, aspects and challenges that we face. And, and so, you know, one of the questions I wanted to ask is, you know, Federico, on the basis of, of uh, Luxterna, you know, when you look at RP and there's some hundred different genetic uh, variabilities that lead to the same type of clinical syndrome, and you're able to access about 2% of the patients, has that been a very big challenge with the regulators in, in showing the value? And then also, um, I don't know if you go back that far, but I'd like to talk to some of the other folks who are going after relatively small patient populations to ask, you know, is, has that been a challenge with the investors thinking that you're gonna need to have a very high per patient cost because you have a very small population. And then we can throw it out to Stefan afterwards because obviously he's going after an agnostic to the genetic type and so potentially has access to a larger population. Anybody have any thoughts on that whole, that whole uh, question scheme? Well, certainly um, there's not, sorry, Jan, go ahead. No, go ahead, Bernard. <laughs> um, so so uh, we, LHON is not such a, a large population of patients and uh, and uh, quite different from others, or probably more similar to to uh, to Luxterna. We our business model is more focused on the incidence, which is about twelve to fifteen hundred new patients every year. That has never been an issue with the investors, um, but we uh, we we raised our money essentially between two thousand thirteen and two thousand nineteen, at a time where there was not that that much a challenge on very often of, of, of very rare diseases. That may come in the, in the future, that may come back as being a challenge, but so far it's not been a challenge and it's, uh, it's probably easier to, for the discussion with the payers because what payers are fearing most is uh, you enter into the field with a rare disease and then you expand to a very large number of patients because your technology can apply to a large number. It's not the case for Lumevark. Lumevark can only target the ND4 mutation in LHON. That would be useless for any other type of disease. So it's a comfortable discussion. And we are having this discussion with both the US payers that are private insurers. We also have this with the public uh, 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 payers in, in Europe. And clearly it is not in the range of what Luxona has obtained as, as a pricing and the pricing of Luxona in uh, in the US is is around seven hundred thousand euro and it's slightly less in uh, in in Europe but not much it's uh, I think it's anywhere between uh, five hundred ninety and uh, and six hundred seventy thousand euro as long as we remain in this uh, ballpark it doesn't seem to be an issue for the payers. Okay. You know, um, one of the things we've taken a a little different approach. You know, we're developing the, the, our implant for the treatment of patients with geographic atrophy. And knowing that that could be a very large number of patients in the US throughout the world. So I think one of the things that we've been realizing right from the inception of the company is that we have to have the cost, the production of our process commensurate with the number of people that we're looking to treat. So, you know, we can't look at six figure numbers <laughs> in order uh, for the cost of our product in order to uh, treat as large an indication. So all of our, I mean, a lot of our focus on the CMC side is looking at costs, how can we manage and manufacture in a streamlined fashion and how much is going to be our cost of goods so that we can develop a product that would be um, 
the costs are going to be reasonable and such that can be supported uh, by various jurisdictions. So again, it's, it's a little different philosophy, but it, it really is something that you know, we've been managing to right from the beginning of the product. Stefan, I wanted to throw it in your direction. You're you're doing more of an ag, you're, you're doing more a genomic therapy, but more of an agnostic approach to the uh, abnormality for retinitis pigmentosa. So there's you know probably 100,000 patients in the U.S., another 150,000 in the EU. What are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, we, we definitely are not in the uh, ultra rare or, or rare you know game. We are um, at the threshold of um, ODD uh, because it's not only applicable to uh, RP but to uh, other run code dystrophy. So if you put all those addressable disease, we are just at the frontier of ODD, and we have received ODD in uh, Europe, and, and 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 we have a dossier uh, ongoing in the uh, in the US as well. Uh, and, and so we are in a, in a, very, uh, in a very different business. Uh, and then when it comes to uh, pricing, uh, this is not what we are doing, vision restoration, this is uh, vision preservation. Uh, and of course, we need to see, you know, how does it work and uh, how, you know, a patient can benefit and for how long before we can speak to pricing. This is definitely way too early for us. But, but again, we are in a different business. Good, Rico, you guys have had some experience because you've been successful. Uh, is there a continual pressure to, to, to cut your costs? Is it, or is it, uh, what, what's been going on with regard to that? Um, I would say, uh, first of all, I'm not uh, an expert in these topics, but cut the cost, you mean cut the cost of goods? Cut the cost of your goods. Well, well to, to, to cut your pricing, yeah, you know, obviously, Obviously, the cost of goods is going to, to some extent, determine the pricing, but I think the cost of development also does as well. But is there a constant downward pressure on your ability to price your product in the world at this point? Um, no. Uh, I mean, I think what, as we were discussing, I was mostly thinking about um, how hard it is to develop uh, a gene therapy, even for a small indication, and, and how costly it is to to make these gene therapy vectors, right? So um, I think there's a, what makes me think is that um, there's a number of diseases that are much more rare than the ultra rare we're trying to treat today that are left out. And I, and I, I just think that perhaps uh, we should also, uh, at some point, we should find a way to address those diseases, whether that's, uh, um, with, with technologies that don't treat the genetic um, indication or making gene therapy uh, cheaper to manufacture. So um, that was where my head was heading more uh, um, in those indications. For the larger indications, I think there's a, there's a market and there will be treatment developed. And speaking to uh, COGS, uh, Federico and Rick, I I'm not sure COGS is, a, is an issue in the eye because you are talking about small doses. Uh, and so I've worked in the liver in the past, for example, or if you look at muscle, uh, yes, cost of good soul will be a, a very important factor in your equation. But when it comes to the eye, um, I I I'm not sure it will um, uh, ever be, uh, you know, a critical uh, a factor in your in your economic equation to be to be to yeah honest. yeah I mean for sure there's there's the cost of development and there's maybe if you're uh, seeking uh, an indication that is a genetic disease that is rare then there's the effort that you have to put into identifying patients which is also non-negligible that's a big effort yeah yeah no definitely the cost of development is one thing I was referring to cogs cost of goods sold the cost of manufacturing your product which is again most of the time negligible in your equation in in the eye for wanna... gene therapy not for cell therapy I don't know for cell therapy Bernard do you have any thoughts on it well I would I would certainly not say that the cost of goods is negligible I think the, the cost of manufacturing commercial batches of material is quite important I and mean, we it depends on the technology you're using, but it can certainly not go down lower than 1.3, 1.5 million per batch. And it depends on the number of, of useful dose you can produce with one batch. But I mean, you need to, uh, to, to put some in the archives. You need to put 
uh, about 30% in the controls. So at the end, it's not very cheap. I mean, yes, it is. We are in a specialty business, right? It's a specialty pharma business. So the gross margin is important. Gross margin is probably in the 90, 90 plus percent. Uh, uh, but but still, the, the the cost of goods is is, is certainly not negligible, uh, and uh, and it can it can certainly go down. At the moment, it's a it's it's a manufacturer business. There's not enough manufacturing capacity around the world, so. So we have to we have to comply with the uh, with the supplier's uh, uh, price and, and when it's a DMO, you're almost stuck for the rest of your life and not going easily to change the, your manufacturing facility for another one. So uh, uh, this is this is what we're we're living through. It can be lowered. I sort of agree. It can be seen as uh, low as compared to the pricing that we have. But also, after all, the pricing has to be put in perspective to the savings you can you can bring to the community. I mean, uh, a blind patient costs roughly. I, there are various studies around this, but blind patients cost an amount of one one hundred fifty one hundred eighty thousand euro per year. If gene therapy really can bring this that brings efficiency for 10 years, 20 years, or even for life, certainly we don't know yet, but we know, I think, Luke Sterner, Federico, with now almost seven or eight years uh, with the maintenance of efficacy, or maybe more, maybe 10 years now. Uh, so if you bring this, then the cost, uh, the pricing, uh, appears to be up uh, to be a, a, a good bargain for the community. Okay, any thoughts? Jane? Yes, sorry. Just, I just wondering if you had any thoughts because yours is the only one that's doing cell therapy. What's been what's been your experience with that? You know, I, I think uh, with regards to the cell therapies, again, it, it's all a function of, you know, how many cells you need and in what configuration you're going to have to produce them. So, you know, again, it's, I think a lot of the challenges in terms of on the CMC side and the production and the production costs are very similar to what you'll get in with the gene therapy vectors. Uh, looking at uh, what Bernard said about CMOs, you know, there still isn't enough capacity to maintain various cell-based therapies and, or gene therapies. Um, so you are very much, um, you know, at risk and very much uh, beholden to, you know, your CMOs and your manufacturing capabilities. So I think that the challenges and the risks are very much the same as what you see in gene therapy. Yeah, my experience with our cell therapy is we're always uh, beholden to the manufacturer and their schedule. And anytime something screws up at the manufacturer, there's 20 other companies that are waiting in line, all trying to scoop up all those manufacturing slots. It seems to me if I were a younger man, I'd go into the cell manufacturing business <laughs> right now because there's certainly some opportunities there. Uh, I'm, I'm just cognizant of our time and I know Federico, you have a hard stop. Is there anything anybody wanted to comment about? Uh, any give la last moment thoughts before we close the panel discussion? Maybe I, I thought I would like to thank you, Rick. Oh, thank you for putting up with me, everybody. Uh, it, it's been it's been enjoyable. It, it would be nice to be there in person with everybody, and we could share some drinks afterwards and tell some of our war stories. I didn't get into a conversation of the challenge of selecting clinical sites. Being a CMO, that's one of the things that you probably are able to uh, to pass on to your various CMOs. But the challenge of selecting clinical sites people's training curves on doing subretinal injections and stuff like that. Those are all some other things that maybe we could talk about next year. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick. Bye-bye, all.